guys, so it's time to start. So welcome in the first ever quantum computing dev room at Fosdem. My name is Tomato Bay, and I'll kind of try to introduce you to this world of quantum computing. And uh, I'm also organizing this room, so I'm responsible if anything goes wrong. So please behave yourself. Here. <laughs> so yeah, you can you maybe notice that the title of the talk changed from what was announced. That's just because my and Mark's talk uh, kind of let me rip out the slides and figure that actually the titles match reversed more than the way they were announced previously. Okay, so introducing the team behind this behind this room, it's uh, mostly me, Mark, and Will. Uh, me and Mark are co-founders of a quantum computing company called Protein Gear, and Will is a person who started so-called <coughs> Unitary Fund, an organization which supports quantum computing by you know, promoting it and, and issuing grants for people that are interested in you know, building some independent quantum computing projects. So you can talk to Will when you are you know, thinking about doing some novel project of your own. Um, and you can also look up some information about the fund at unitary.fund. Okay, so in this talk I would li like to answer three questions. And those three questions are basically what is quantum computing? Why should we invest in learning quantum computing? And why should we do quantum computing with open source? Um, and I'm going to answer them in a reversed way. So I'm going to start from the perspective of why quantum computing and open source does uh, make sense. So the idea behind even having this room originally started back in the summer of 2018. Uh, I was in London and I met one of the organizers of Fosdem. And uh, I was going to be a quantum computing talk uh, at a like, local meetup group there. <coughs> and basically, the question came up whether it would be a good time now to, to start a developer room on quantum computing. <coughs> and back at that point, uh, me and Mark were working on a review paper about quantum computing and open source, like all the op uh, like different open source projects in the quantum computing space, evaluating them and, and comparing them and trying to identify what are the gaps and what are the like, strengths of these uh, projects. And eventually we figured out that, you know, this is a new technology which is gonna potentially revolutionize many industries. And similar to AI, like we kind of felt that there shouldn't be some kind of monopolization you know, by just one hardware vendor and them like owning the whole software stack, which would which would make it hard for other companies to you know develop their own hardware and capture some of the market. And uh, also for that reason, we, we actually just thought that there would be a, you know, a useful contribution from our side if we could start a formal body that would try to <coughs> govern the space and try to like steward people to you know publish their code open source and, and make sure that uh, companies you know, govern themselves in a, in a more like open governance models. And the whole thing is like developing a more community-based based model. So that's what would be. Quantum Open Source Foundation is, uh, is about, and uh, <coughs> that's why like, the uh, description of this room is hosted on, on our site. So feel free to check it out. Uh, oh, shit, I never put it on. Okay, that's good. I'm swearing it's from the beginning again. Can you stay between the two lines on the on your left? Yeah, here. Uh, okay. Because you are not in the video, otherwise, if you, you should go. <laughs> here. No, these two. Between these two? Yeah. No, no, Here's one line. Yeah. Oh, between these two lines. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay, I haven't been notified about that. Okay, so that's, that's good to know. <laughs> All right. And do we have like a clicker, some or, or not? I can give you one. All right. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Never mind. Um, All right. So that's Quantum Open Source Foundation. So for those for the, those of you that are just joining us through the video streams and video recording, <laughs> I was just describing the team behind the room, and that's mostly the team behind the open source, uh, Quantum Open Source Foundation. No. What's right? Thank you. All right. Um, so what awaits us here for the next two days is going to be two days full, packed full of talks. Um, <laughs> today is Saturday, and basically we're going to have... You can just, uh, on the yeah, I'm going to try it. You have a button on the left. Hmm? <coughs> I have to turn it on? Do you? 
Beautiful. OK. <laughs> it's working now. So today, quantum computing dev room, we're going to have talks by basically every major so-called full stack quantum platform out there and some major open source projects. These are mostly often, or, yeah, often company supported uh, projects, but they're open to contributions and they are released under open source licenses. So these are projects like QuizKit, Forest, Strawberry Fields, and a uh, multitude of other, other libraries and, uh, and projects. And I'm not going to dwell on them too, too long because there's going to be a ded dedicated talk to uh, each of these. And tomorrow, at least for me, that's the more, more exciting part, is because we're going to have a portfolio of, uh, in total, 11 open source projects that are you know, less prominent because they are developed by, let's say, single main authors or, or contributors. Um, and, and they're going like, to present their projects. And we will try, as a community, you know, figure out ways how we can you know, help. So we're going to hold a hackathon sprint in the afternoon where we will divide into different groups. And each group will try to hack on that particular project, maybe just learn how it works, you know, provide feedback in terms of like doc your documentation works or not, what could be improved, <coughs> stuff like that. And each group is going to be coached by the particular developer that is, you know, representing the project here. So if you want to make sure you have a spot and you don't wait in the line like people out there, um, sign up. There's only like 20 people signed up, so, and and the capacity of the room is like 90 people, so there is still some spots available. So why invest in learning quantum computing right now? Um, well, it's a good time because quantum chips are already here. Um, this is, I think, the D-Waves chip. But uh, Google, Rigetti, IBM, they all have their own quantum computing hardware, and they are not the only ones. But a couple of them also provide access. So you are able to play with these devices even as an independent researcher or just random person out there who's interested. Uh, you can get access to these things, and you can try them out, try what you can do with them. So it's no longer a thing which is uh, a purely academic thing. It's a domain which is being explored also for commercial purposes, which you know, creates interest, creates jobs, creates uh, opportunities. And uh, there, are, there is like a fight going on. Uh, you know, uh, every country wants to be labeled as being the progressive one and the one that invests in the in these technologies. So we can see that the China, European Union, USA, they're all, all passing these big bills saying that we're going to support quantum computing. And there's also a bunch of private funding going on and totaling $700 million into multiple companies. And the, the most funded ones, or the ones that raised the most money I've listed here. But there's a bunch of other ones, including my company, that uh, uh, isn't on the list. Yeah. and. Uh, if you have ideas that you want to explore, there's also you know, support for early entrepreneurs. Um, Protein Cure was founded as part of the CDL, which is the um, most prominent uh, incubator or slash accelerator thing in, in Canada, basically. Um, and probably the only specific to quantum computing, or they call it quantum machine learning um, you know, domain uh, in the world. So applications to that are open now. I, I encourage you to Google out to see like, you know, what's it, what's this about. Um, it's a really good experience to go through this. All right. So in the interest of time, um, I still have I think 16 minutes. So we'll do a very quick overview over the paradigms of quantum computing. Um, each of these will be covered in depth today. So don't worry if you don't understand something. I'm going to provide just like a very high level <coughs> intuition uh, behind these things. Okay, so the three paradigms I'm going to describe are quantum annealing, uh, then discrete gate-based computation, and uh, continuous gate-based computation. All right, so in the quantum annealing, basically what you're doing, you are crafting energy landscapes that you want to explore. Um, on the left, there's a particular example of what we're doing. Um, it's an optimization problem for trying to find Confirmations of a protein. This is the so-called protein folding problem, and you know, going through some hoops, you can express that as a so-called binary optimization problem. And what the computer, quantum computer does is that it explores this landscape using 
some elements of or properties of uh, quantum mechanics, such as you know, quantum tunneling, depicted on, on, on the right. And one of the biggest players uh, in that space is, uh, is D-Wave. They have been uh, around for many, many years. Uh, I think making quantum com chips since 2000, early 2003. I'm not sure they started developing hardware at that point, but the company is around for yeah, 15, 15 years. Um, or maybe I'll be corrected on that number probably, but uh, it's the longest uh, you know, company that is around. And uh, this is a little bit of, bit of math, but basically what it describes is just, uh, oh, I have a pointer. So what well, it describes is just like you have two variables, binary variables that are coupled by a constant. So you have quadratic terms and you have scalar terms. And you are basically able to specify this polynomial. And that polynomial describes the energy landscape. And the device tries to find the assignment to these variables such that the energy of this term or this expression is, is minimal. And the way this is done is, is basically it happens on this chip. and your goal is to embed your problem on the variables such that the connections between the variables are, are realized on the chip. So this is the problem of the so-called graph embedding. And uh, I'm not going to elaborate on it, but uh, it uh, basically creates additional overhead in like putting the problem on the hardware. So we can imagine that this is, this is very low-level approach. Like uh, you can have problems here like missing qubits because they were disabled, they had some manufacturing problems, or missing couplings. And you have to account for, for, for these things when you are embedding. Um, OK. So just a quick co code you know, demonstration, how it looks like, such that you have a, you know, just a cursory glance. Uh, this is a very simple problem where you have four qubits here. And uh, they're all anti-correlated, which basically means that we have couplings of one here. And what, what this? System is supposed to be um, what, what the lowest energy system of this of or lowest energy state of the system is, is basically um, like alternations of ones and minus ones. So these variables they can be either one or minus one, and to achieve basically the lowest uh, expression value, you have to alternate them here. Anyway, this is how we do it. Uh, they have a pretty nice API. You just specify these couplings in a dictionary, and then you embed it using this class, and then you can directly sample um, using using this using this uh, interface. And you can use either classical samplers or you can sample out of the machine if you have access. Um, it's it's basically transparent. So, from a high level, this is this is what is going on. Um, you have a problem. You formulate it in terms of this quadratic binary optimization problem, or Ising model uh, is another name for it. Then you embed the problem the problems graph into the chip, and then you sample out of it your solutions. Um, and there's D-Wave Leap, which is basically a platform which gives you access. Uh, I'm not sure it's available in, in Europe, but definitely it's available in North America. Um, and you can get one minute free of time to, to explore these things. Uh, some more resources for people that are watching this on the video uh, later. Um, so the other paradigm is uh, so-called universal gate-based quantum computing. And there you are designing these quantum circuits. Uh, an example of quantum circuit is on the right. Uh, so these are the gates. Um, this is a gate, but this is also a gate. So this gate interacts with two qubits. That's why it like, stretches two lines. Each line is one, one qubit. I should probably explain that. And these boxes are basically measurements. So to read out the result of the computation, you have to measure and collapse the quantum state. And that's <coughs> depicted by this symbol. And the uh, big players here are basically IBM, Google, Rigetti. The reason majority of these uh, big companies are investigating this kind of uh, platform is because this is actually where the majority of the theoretical results were proven at. Um, like all these Shor's algorithm, you know, uh, all these threats that we hear about quantum computing come from theoretical results on these kind of architectures. So this is the qubit. No reason to you know, get too scared about it. I'm not going to dwell for too much. I'm just, I just want you to you know, see these uh, equations first. Um, these are two basic, basic states, and these are two complex numbers that uh, together comprise the quantum state. 
Uh, visually, we depict the qubit uh, as living on this sphere called the block sphere. All right, so here, basically, we don't have binary variables anymore, like during the computation, but the variables themselves are quantum variables that are basically a combination of those two basis states. Um, and you apply these operations, and you read out at, at the end your result. So again, it's very, very low level. You're designing a circuit. It's almost like doing you know, a, some, some board. Like You're not soldiering it, but you are basically operating on, on a very low level. Uh, all right, so I was going to just uh, rush through this. This is an example of how you apply two gates. Um, this is the first gate, which basically does to, to state 0 does this, and to state 1 does this. Um, yeah, not really important for, for the demonstration here, just for illustration. This is a different gate, uh, so-called controlled uh, not gate. And if you combine these two gates together, you can create what we call maximally entangled state. So if you measure this, uh, you can get one of the two outcomes. It's either 0, 0 on both of these qubits or 1, 1 on both of these qubits. And why is that? Uh, it's going to be explained later uh, today. I mostly wanted to show you this um, so, that, so that you have actual you know, idea how it looks at the software layer. Um, basically, you are writing Python code which, gener which generates this quantum assembler, you might think, or this is so-called quill code. Um, so it's really low-level instructions, you know, apply this gate at this qubit, apply this gate at, for those two qubits, then measure these two qubits, and here's your result. And you have to be clever about what you're doing, such that you, at the end, measure something which is going to be useful for you. All right, so the gate model workflow from the, you know, uh, high up. Basically, you have the problem. You encode your problem. I mean, you have to figure out the quantum algorithm for your problem. And then you basically implement that algorithm as a quantum circuit. Then that quantum circuit has to be compiled, because the actual hardware platform doesn't support all the gates that you might think that uh, you need. They actually support only a subset of the gates, so-called fundamental subset. And uh, that basically means that some of the gates here will be like you know, expanded into multiple gates in the, ser in the series of, of different gates, which again, like, you know, a little bit boosts or bo like blows up you know, the circuit of the, of the computation, which is basically the problem we're facing right now with the devices because each operation is noisy to a certain degree. So the more of these gates you apply, the less certain you can be about the result that you're going to get uh, at the very end. OK, so some uh, further resources uh, about this um, for people that are, that are interested, but mostly for people that are just you know, going to look, look at this um, over the internet or later just look at the slides. And very briefly about the continuous variable quantum computing. So here you switch the concept of the qubit with the concept of a, of a Q mode, which uh, you can see it's continuous. See this nice integral sign here? Um, as opposed to you know having two discrete signs, uh, two discrete states, basis states uh, here. And the big player in this field is uh, Zandu, and we're going to have two talks from from people uh, from from Zandu today. So they're going to delve uh, much deeper into this into this topic than I could. So, yeah, I wanted to also give some further resources about that, about this. Um, they have nice uh, API layer. I would almost say one of the best out there is uh, like the API of the strawberry fields. And uh, that's that. Thank you for your attention. And uh, if you have any questions, please shoot me up. We have some time. Yeah, sure. You can assume that. But you said something that piqued my interest. Uh, you mentioned that as you work with more gates, you have an increased uncertainty on the result. And I, that made me very curious. What, what do you mean by increased in uncertainty? Well, okay, so uh, so the question, uh, the question was uh, I mentioned during the talk 
that the more gates you apply, the less certain you can be about the result you're going to get at the end. Um, so when people are developing these quantum algorithms, um, they are operating in a you know, um, fairy tale world, basically, uh, where everything works nicely and uh, physics of the system don't interfere with the computation, um, which is a big problem because reality isn't like that. In reality, we have noise. The operations we're trying to do aren't perfect. So like, these gates that uh, I described are basically all in some sense, rotations of the, of the, of the states on, the, on that block sphere. And you can imagine that the rotation itself is, can be imprecise. Now, what happens if I you know, do one imprecise rotation and then I end up a little bit somewhere else than I, than I thought, and I'm going to apply another a little bit imprecise rotation? And after like, you know, multiplying these imprecisions, they're going to blow up, and they're going to basically make my state be somewhere completely elsewhere than I was you know, planning it to be for it to perform the computation I wanted to, to perform. So there's remedies for this. There's so-called um, quantum error correction. And uh, that's what the industry is aiming for, to, to find the you know, good quantum error correction algorithms that will basically use multiple qubits, multiple hardware qubits, as one logical qubit, but which is error-free, which basically is able to carry on the computation almost indefinitely long. Um, and then you can basically perform the algorithms that you wanted to perform um, you know, in, a, in, a, in a theory sense of the word. So maybe to elaborate on that a little bit, uh, the big question right now is how do we use these devices even though they are uh, not noiseless, even though that we don't have enough qubits such that we can realize this so-called quantum error correction. And uh, that's basically the purpose of uh, the research, or, or main, one of the main area, areas of the research right now, so-called know, noisy intermediate scale quantum computing. Thank you very much. Yes? Can you correct the uniform phase error? Sorry? If all your qubits get a different phase, there's no correction possible. That was the question for you. Yes, so the question was if uh, all the qubits have <coughs> like the same error in phase. Yeah, well, I, would, I would say that's a, that's a question for an expert in uh, quantum error correction, which I'm not. But uh, definitely, I, I didn't get a sense that uh, this is one of the problems that uh, yeah, maybe we can elaborate on it. There's this thing called a threshold theorem. So as long as your error rates per gate are below a certain threshold, you can correct them arbitrarily. No. Yeah. Well, there, are, there are different error models that people have tested. Um, and it's that you know, we, when we, we build the devices, we're going to see how much our theoretical studies of the error models map to the real error models on, on the high yeah, I mean, a more, a more general form of that question would be what, what is the, the channel, the error channel, that most matches the physics? Yeah. <coughs> With the current number of qubits, is there uh, any problem that you already <coughs> have speed up that you cannot do with classical computers, or is it low cost? Do you get a, can you solve problems that cost less on com quantum computers than classical computers? So I want to drive this point home. Uh, okay, so the question. The question is whether with the current number of qubits we can do anything on a quantum computer like faster or less expensive than we can do on a, on a classical computer. And predominantly, the answer to that question is no, we can't. And uh, that's, um, we can't like, solve any useful problems on a quantum computer right now like faster or, or, or better than a classical computer can. Although, that's something that we are basically trying to you know, explore right now. Like, what is, what is the point at which we will be able to. Um, but yes, one of the concerns of mine, a long-term concern, is that is the hype in, in the industry, which is gonna, which can you know, completely destroy uh, the whole space. We had things like AI winter, basically, when people hyped up artificial intelligence too much, and then funding for artificial intelligence went down. And that's the thing that I'm afraid of uh, in quantum computing as well. 
Um, so, yeah, not right now. But the question is, maybe in the near term, we'll be able to find some problems where quantum computing helps. And that's uh, the concept of uh, having quantum advantage, uh, strong or, or weak. Um, so, to finish on a, on a conclusive point, yeah, the answer to your question is no. <laughs> yeah, okay, so that's it, we're out of time. <coughs> Thank you.